This Wi-Fi sucks. Is your family hassling you about subpar Wi-Fi? Do your kids roll their eyes at you when their friends can't connect? Dad, why isn't the Wi-Fi working? Does your wife yell at you when Yellowstone Buffer is on her Apple TV? Hey Dave, the Wi-Fi's not working. Well, in today's episode of Dave's Garage, we'll be taking on one of the most frustrating and infuriating problems that modern families face. Slow and unreliable home Wi-Fi. If you're tired of endless buffering, drop connections, and devices that won't even connect, then this is the video for you. I'll be showing you some easy and practical tips as I go through how I manage all 10 of my own access points here at home. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and get ready to unleash the full potential of your home Wi-Fi with the Angry Dad's Guide to Awesome Home Wi-Fi. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm not going to spend a lot of time flexing my house at you in this episode, but let's just say it's over 100 feet wide and has various shops and outbuildings, and covering it all with Wi-Fi has always been a challenge. As a result, I've learned a lot about how to build out reliable Wi-Fi in a complex location, and today I'm going to share that knowledge with you. We're going to learn how I solve some of the most vexing problems with Wi-Fi, such as getting adequate coverage, extending that coverage even where you don't have a LAN cable, handing off seamlessly from one access point to another as you move around, network management, and guest networking. When we first moved in about 15 years ago, I set up two completely separate wireless routers, one towards each end of the house. I used the venerable Linksys WRT54G, a router that had served me well for years. I gave each of them separate SSIDs, and you had to join them both before you'd have complete coverage. There was no real handoff from access point to access point, so unfortunately, you could often wind up using a poor connection back to the other end of the house. Turning Wi-Fi off and back on would fix that, but it was a hassle. Still, as clunky as it was, it was good enough for my own use back then, but soon enough my kids got old enough to have their own phones. My wife has her iPad, a MacBook, an Apple TV, and so on, and suddenly everybody in the house is a wireless connoisseur. Worse, no matter what the actual problem is, any failed or slow connection to any site seems to be enough to prompt cries of, Dad, the Wi-Fi's down. I decided to move to Ubiquity or Unify Wireless, which is essentially a professional-grade product available direct to consumers from Unify. Unless you buy it from a service provider of some kind, you're on your own for supporting it more or less, but as we'll see, it's all pretty straightforward. They use shiny new user interfaces in the browser for configuration and management, so it's not like arm wrestling some old Cisco router. Now, this was long before I started my channel, so it was certainly not and is not sponsored in any way. It's just the informed choice that I made based at the time on what was available. And since I live by the maxim of I didn't get rich by writing a lot of checks, I started small with just three access points. One thing I'll be stressing today is integrated management with a single Wi-Fi controller, but at that size, you don't even need a central controller, at least not a dedicated box. You can install the controller software on pretty much any computer, and that's precisely what I did. My house was already extensively set up with Cat6 runs back to a server closet when it was wired, so adding access points that were tied into the home LAN was generally fairly simple. Should the controller software go down or the PC it's running on crashes, your Wi-Fi access points continue to operate. They just don't get optimized and managed automatically. Perhaps the second most important point is to use hardwired access points wherever possible. This means the access point plugs directly into your LAN with an Ethernet cable. If you don't have a way to get a wired connection to a secondary access point, however, all is not lost. Most of the current Ubiquiti line can operate in both a direct LAN connected mode and by wireless uplink. That means it must have at least one hardwired access point, of course, for any of them to have connectivity. But beyond that, you can allow the access points to wirelessly uplink to one another, which means the disconnected access points use Wi-Fi to connect back to another access point and relay the information along. It works perfectly well for probably everything except ping-sensitive activities like competitive gaming. It does require that the access points themselves have at least enough connectivity with each other to exchange their data, as they're not magic. If you're getting no signal at all to some point, you'll need to install an intermediate access point between them to act as a relay or hardwire the far access point. My preference is to always hardwire, as it provides superior performance, saturates the available wireless bandwidth less, and you have to power them anyway, so you've already got at least one cable to manage. The Ubiquiti access points are powered through their Ethernet cables. That means you can send power to them right from the switch, if that switch is capable of PoE, or you can inject power into the LAN cable using what's known as a PoE injector. 
It takes a network connection in, a power connection, and outputs a PoE-powered Ethernet connection that supplies all the power the access point needs right over the LAN cable. In fact, there is no separate power port on the access points. It has to come through the LAN cable somehow. Because I didn't have a switch that could do PoE, that's also how I rolled until I decided to add even more access points for better coverage and to move to the Dream Machine Pro. The unified Dream Machine Pro is a rack mount solution that has the wireless network controller built right in. It also runs one of my security camera systems, and it can run your home or business phones as well. It has two 10 gigabit ports and 16 regular gigabit ports. The one thing that strangely doesn't have though is PoE, though that's now offered in the SE model and I recommend you go that way. But at the time I bought the Pro, the SE wasn't out. That meant I needed a PoE switch to send power to all of my access points. Ultimately, I added four pieces of Unify rack mount equipment to support my network. The Unify Dream Machine Pro, a 24 port PoE switch that features two 10G ports, a 48 port gigabit switch that also features two 10G ports, and a 10 gigabit aggregation switch to bring all of my 10G home networking together. I did a dedicated episode on 10 and 25 gigabit home networking, so be sure to check it out next if you haven't already, and make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so that you don't miss episodes like this one. Now I color code all my network cables by using red for powered PoE connections, yellow for 10 gigabit, and blue for simple one gigabit connections. You'll also notice some black 10 gigabit direct attached copper cables for shorter runs between the switches and so on. While I have about 50 LAN drop points that I have to service, your needs are likely a bit simpler and so you don't need this much hardware. In fact, with the Dream Machine SE, which features PoE ports and two 10 gigabit ports, that single box may be very well all you ever need. They also make a wall mount version of the Dream Machine if you don't have a rack to mount things in. Ultimately, you need access points, somewhere to run the controller software, and some way to power those access points. The Dream Machine SE isn't the only way to accomplish it, but it's a turnkey solution that I highly recommend. The Dream Machine also features a 3.5 inch hard drive bay for recording video streams that come in from Unify cameras, and I've put a 20 terabyte drive inside which gives me months of recording history. Let's use our web browser to bring up the user interface for the Dream Machine. Once we're logged in, we're greeted with a diagram of the network topology. In my case, we can see that the Dream Machine Pro is the root of the network on the far left. From there, it branches to the 10 gigabit aggregation switch, which in turn connects to the two main switches, that 24 port PoE switch and the 48 port gigabit switch. Although you're not limited to using only Unify switches on the network, the nice thing about them when you do use them is that they show up in the management interface. So I can see an eight port switch connected to my Crestron automation system, another switch in the media closet and so on. Cameras and access points are also listed here. If I click on the floor plan tab, I can see a blueprint of the house and the various devices overlaid upon it. This is as simple as uploading an image of your floor plan and then dragging the icons around to correspond to the physical locations of the switches and the access points. Let's click on the network button, which takes us to the interface for the entire network. On the main page, you'll find a host of statistics about your network, such as your public IP addresses. I have two service providers for redundancy, one cellular and one cable. The Dream Machine will automatically prefer the faster cable modem but fall over to the cellular backup during power or cable outages. Speaking of which, my rack is backed up with an extreme power UPS that can run the entire rack for several hours. Since the UPS powers the rack and the rack powers the switch and the switch powers the access points, it means everything remains up and operational during power outages. Since cell service is fairly weak at my location, having Wi-Fi during such an outage is a definite plus. You'll also find a host of stats about your network usage, such as where your traffic is going and how many clients are connected. Currently, I have more than 100 devices connected to the LAN, which is likely more than you'll have, but not all that surprising when you think of the number of phones, computers, home automation devices, and LED controllers that are scattered around this house. You can also see your most active access points and which clients are using the most bandwidth. The bottom of the screen shows wireless performance over the last 24 hours, and you can see how your network has been performing. If we click on the Topology tab, we get a broader view of the network, as this view includes the end user devices and shows how they are connected to the network. If we zoom in and scroll around, we can see various devices such as smart TVs, laptops, and phones. Dash lines represent a wireless connection, whereas LAN connections are shown as solid lines. Clicking on the Unified Devices tab provides a list of all the main devices on the network, such as the Dream Machine Pro itself, the switches, access points, and cameras that are connected. It's your single point of access to all Unify hardware on the network. 
If I click on a particular access point, such as the shop Wi-Fi, I can see every client that's connected to this particular access point and how their signal is performing. You can also pin devices to a particular access point if you find, for example, that an IoT device is connected to a distant or otherwise suboptimal access point. If we click on the Clients tab, we get a list of every device on the network. We can see how it's connected, such as by LAN, 2.4, or 5 GHz wireless. We see every device in this view that's been granted an IP to talk on the network, down to and including the smart laps like the LifeX Wi-Fi bulbs that I use in the shop. The Wi-Fi Insights tab contains a ton of information about your Wi-Fi network, such as which channels are busy, which clients are connected via what channel, and so on. This is for more advanced tuning, such as channel allocation, and you can use these graphs to help fine-tune what access points use what channels if you wish to manually configure such things. To be honest, however, I've had pretty good luck in letting the Unify access points sort it out for themselves. The controller even runs a nightly scan that it uses to optimize channel allocation for your particular setup. On the settings page, there are three options you may wish to become familiar with. The first is known as band steering, which forces devices that are capable of 5G to move to the 5G band rather than wasting space on the 2.4 GHz band. The next is fast roaming, which is a wireless network feature that enables clients to seamlessly switch between different access points without experiencing any interruption in their connectivity. The Unified Dream Machine Pro offers fast roaming capabilities through implementation of the 802.11k and 802.11v protocols. These fairly new protocols allow the UDM Pro to communicate with other Unify access points in the network and exchange information about signal strength, available bandwidth, and other metrics. Using this information, the UDM Pro can intelligently guide a client device towards the access point with the strongest signal and the least amount of congestion, enabling fast and seamless roaming. Furthermore, the UDM Pro also supports the use of 802.11r, which enables clients to pre-authenticate with neighboring access points before they are actually needed, further reducing the time it takes to switch between access points. Fast roaming on the Unify Dream Machine Pro provides a reliable and efficient wireless experience for users, ensuring that they can move around the network without any interruptions or loss of connectivity. If you've ever had issues with wandering around your house and getting a weak signal from a distant access point when you're standing right under a closer one, you'll love fast roaming. Not all devices support the modern protocols needed to handle it, but most phones do, and it's phones where it's the most needed. Now, regardless of how many switches and access points you wind up with, or even which brand, there are a few major guidelines to follow when it comes to setting up a reliable home Wi-Fi system. First, plan your network. Before you start installing access points, create a plan for your Wi-Fi network. Determine the size of your home, the number of access points you believe you'll need, and where to place them. You can use any of several Wi-Fi planning tools online to help you optimize your network design. At the end of the day, however, every home is different. What works in one home may not work in another just to variations in wall thickness, where the access point is placed relative to metal vents, and so on. My very rough guideline is that you'll need about one access point for every 1,500 or so square feet of living space, but it varies wildly with layout and construction. So if you have the patience, the best way is to start with a single hardwired access point, find out where the signal reaches well and where it does not, and then add access points as needed to build the system out. You should use modern, high-quality access points. Choose access points that support the latest Wi-Fi standards and have good range and coverage. Avoid cheap or outdated access points, as they may not provide the performance you need and they may not implement modern standards such as fast roaming. You should use wired backhaul. If possible, connect all of your access points using wired Ethernet cables. This provides a more reliable and stable connection between your access points and helps prevent interference. Power them right from the switch if possible, or use PoE injectors at the access point installation site. You can also use a PoE injector back at the switch if you want to push power through the entire LAN cable right from there. If you're not using something like the UDM Pro that automatically analyzes and assigns channels, separate your Wi-Fi channels. To avoid interference, assign different Wi-Fi channels to each access point. You can use a Wi-Fi analyzer app on your phone to check for interference and select the best channels. And finally, always try to use a unified management system like the Unify setup that you've seen here today. This makes it easier to monitor your network, troubleshoot problems, and update your access points with the latest firmware. It also gives you a single point of reference to investigate when trying to troubleshoot a problem. So where do you begin? Well, I think a great place to start would be with a Unified Dream Machine Pro and two or three access points. Experiment with their location to try to get yourself the best coverage you can, and if you have cold spots in your Wi-Fi, add an extender. 
In my own case, I use ceiling mount UAP Pros in most cases, but in at least two instances, I use these smaller juice can style access points that can sit on a shelf or windowsill. Again, they support hardwire to the LAN, but if you don't have a LAN port nearby, they also work via wireless uplink to extend your network to problematic areas. At the end of the day, it comes down to a case of Wi-Fi costs money, kid. How connected do you want to be? One additional point of advice that I have is that if you have kids and or a lot of visitors to your house, add a public access spot. The UDM Pro makes this easy and it enables a key feature that I think you must absolutely use if doing so. VLAN ID. A VLAN splits your network into multiple networks that are isolated from one another. Traffic from one VLAN cannot see or reach clients on another VLAN. To that end, then, I have my LAN split into three VLANs. The first is our main home VLAN, where everyone connects to their phones and their PCs. The second is an IoT Wi-Fi VLAN. I've given it a separate SSID so that when I connect devices from offshore or untrusted manufacturers, they're isolated on their own VLAN. They can still connect back to their home servers via the internet, but they can't see the rest of my home network. It's much like a sandbox that keeps IoT devices separate from all of my other networking. I also have a third VLAN for the public access hotspot. This ensures that guests that connect to the public hotspot can't see the rest of the network, only the internet. While in theory somebody could sit outside my house and burn some bandwidth, they wouldn't be any further ahead in breaching my security as they're locked down into an independent VLAN. Each VLAN gets its own unique ID, like 101, and can have separate IP ranges as well. Using the Unify management system, you can even specify that a particular port on a particular switch can only provide access to a subset of VLANs. If you'd like to learn more about VLAN networking, let me know in the video comments and I'll do an episode dedicated to the topic. Now, I realize that channel subscriptions don't have a lot of impact on what videos you see unless you specifically turn on personalized notifications, but I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. Subscriptions are how I measure the growth of the channel, so give me a little dopamine hit by clicking on the subscribe button. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. If you have questions or suggestions, please leave a comment in the comment section. In the meantime and in between time, I will see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it!